Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hello, I'm Julia Simic, playing for AC Milan, and you're listening to the Bola Bola Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show. My name is Ivan, and as always here, I'm joined by my two co-host buddies. First and foremost, Bala. How's it going, Bala? Hey, Sivan. Thanks for bringing me in. Things are going good. Elvin, I'm sure you also doing the same thing. Hey, hello, guys. Yep, things are great here. And, uh, you know, today we got a great show today because uh, today at the Bola Bola Show, we are honoured to have on board the German Women's International Player. She's got, she represented the country twice and is currently playing for the AC Milan Women's Team. So, Bola Bola Show here welcomes Miss Julia Simic. Hello, Hello Julia. Everyone. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thanks for yeah. having me. It's a how, pleasure. Yeah, great to have you on board. And how have things been for you lately? Um, yeah, everything is really good here in Italy, apart from obviously the weather. <laughs> it starts snowing here as well, but also obviously the pandemic is a bit, everything is a little bit restricted and not normal, but we make the best out of it and we're happy to still play football. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Okay, okay. So moving on with the question. Uh, Julia, what is your inspiration for playing football and pursuing it for a career, uh, especially you are coming from a German background? Mm, I think basically my biggest inspiration to play football is, is the passion. So I just always love to play football since I'm five or six years old. I never had this one person, I would say, in my life or an idol I was admiring and that's the reason why I played I think I just fell in love with the game by just kicking a ball with like really young age and since then I never yeah I, I, I could not not do it anymore so I was always stick to football since I'm as I said five or six years old and since then I've I played with the boys for a long time until I was 16 and I think that helped as well my older brother helped as well as well my dad loves football so the family background also maybe inspired me a little bit to play football. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And, uh, you know, growing up, which particular footballer that you look up to as a role model? The, someone you wanted to emulate as a footballer and why was that? Um, so I would say the, the biggest footballer for me when I was younger was always Zidane. So that was oh, mm. maybe my role model <laughs> also because I'm also a central midfielder and he used to play on the number 10 and yeah, he was for me the best, or oh, yeah, all-time best footballer because I think he was just, he had something really, really special. Yeah, now you have Ronaldo and you have Messi and Neymar and all these great footballers. But back then when I was young, younger, I always admired Zinedine Zidane. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and, and so you play in the Zidane's role these days, the number 10 role. Yeah? Yes. So every, from when I started football, basically, I was always... In the middle of the pitch, and we also, because Zidane was maybe a big role model, I always tried to grab the number 10 as well. So when you're younger and you play, especially in boys' teams, everyone would be trying to get the number 10. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a little, <laughs> a little fight for this number. And sometimes the coaches would help me and say, now Julia gets it because she's the only girl or maybe I had a little advantage, but <laughs> also because it was my position, you know. So... Yeah, that helped a bit that I was a, a, a girl, I think. <laughs> mm, okay. And uh, in Julia, you know, having played in Germany, England, and now in Italy, I mean, what are some of the differences of footballing culture that you have experienced so far in these countries? Mm, I also played in England the last two years, so I think I can compare three mm-hmm. really football-crazy countries to each other. So in Germany, football is huge. In, in Italy, football has a... It's almost a religion, I would say, in England the same. Everyone would have their club and it doesn't matter if you're 90 years old, if you're a woman or a man, if you're a kid or whatever, you all, everyone has their club, you know. So that's something I loved in England, that football would be just everywhere. But I kind of experience it the same way here in Italy. So when I grab my pizza in the restaurant next door, they are um, splitted, so there are some Inter Milan fans and um, AC Milan fans, and 
you always have to be careful who you who's making your pizza because they <laughs> have to for, for AC one <laughs> and it's always like please let not do him the pizza for me <laughs> but um, no I think it's it's quite similar from the craziness from the people who love the sport it's the same here in Italy than it is in Germany uh, obviously the philosophy of the game itself is a bit different I would say in Germany is a lot of I would say possession tactic here in Italy, they spend a lot of, or put a lot of focus on defending as well. So it's also tactical, whereas in England it's more powerful and towards the goal. So you can also sense some differences in the game itself, I would say. Mm -hmm. And would you say that this culture also is the same when it comes to women football in particular? Um, no, mm -hmm. I would say uh, Italy is still a really young country, if I can say this, if that uh -huh. makes sense in, in women's football. They just really started, they always had also a women's team, for example, the national team, but they just start to become a professional league here as mm. well. So when you compare it to the German league who exists now for years and it's on a really high and professional level, England has a pr complete professional league, which is outstanding in Europe. It doesn't exist anywhere else or so all the clubs playing in the it's called WSL the women Premier League basically and they all professional so it's not just that the players earn so much money which is not the case it's more you have a doctor there you have physios there you have good pitches there you have great facilities basically around playing football and that's something that's just starting here in Italy so I would say the standing of women's football is not there where it is already in Germany or England but it's coming and you can see big clubs like Milan starting now to have a women's side and taking it really serious and bringing in foreign players who already have experienced and played on the highest level, I think shows a lot that they really ambitious to become also a really, really good league here in Italy. Mm -hmm. And of course, tell us about your experience when you were selected to play for the German national team. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was, I think I was, so I was selected already when I was 21, then I got a bad injury while I was in my first camp, but then it took a while for me to make it back to the squad. And that's something I would say when it really happened that I also played a match finally, I think I was 26 already. So it was a really late debut, if I can say this. Um, and it, yeah, it kind of, it was a release as well, because I was finally playing for the dream I've always had you know and obviously some injuries hold me back from playing for the German national team but I think that's that's not obviously not the only reason why I would say it's just been the injuries but I waited a long time for this day to come so for me it was a it's a great day great memories when I think back and all my family was there it was also in Bavaria where I'm from and it was just a good day we won and I played quite good so it was Obviously, it's, it's a bit of a dream who, who came true, yeah. Okay. Moving on to your Milan team currently, I think you are fighting neck-to-neck -neck with the Juventus on the Serie A title or Scudetto. So, yeah. what are the chances, since you're saying that Milan has taken the team very seriously, and what are the chances of them winning the title, facing off the team at Juventus? Um, hard question, definitely. I think we have some high ambitions, and I think we have a right to dream big because we have a really good squad. We have a really good coach. We have good stuff around the team. Everything is really professional. Um, and that's obviously, it's then you want to you wanna also play for a reason. You don't just want to play to see where you end up. You want to reach something and achieve something. So obviously we, we're dreaming of big goals. We want to make it to the Champions League, for example, but we also want to win something maybe if possible this year in the league you know so there's the cups there is the scudetto as you said so the championship it's just i think at the moment you can't say it's gonna be them or it's gonna be us or it's gonna be a different team like there are all, all other teams as well which are competitive but i think having this in you it's it's healthy and it's good to have like saying i'm training because at the end of the season I'm training today in the snow, for example, because at the end of the season, I want to lift something. I want to have a trophy. I want to qualify for the Champions League. And that's maybe it's far and it's a goal that's not really, you can't really sense it at the moment, but it keeps you motivated, I think, during the season. And that's really, we brought us in a really good position, I would say, to 
win something and we have to keep going. We have two more games this year. We want to win them, obviously, and then have a really good yeah, starting point for next year to aim high. And hopefully we have something in our hands at the end of the season. But uh, do you get some kind of uh, motivation from the mainstream as well? Or maybe the, you know, because they're also doing well in the Syria right moment. So is there any kind of uh, inspiration from them as well? Um, no, you can say see that there's a lot of support from the men's side as well. For example, Maldini is always there, like the president is always there. The, the men's side, the people who are in charge of the men's side also watching the women's um, games, which mm-hmm. already shows that it's one club. It's one, you always say a bit like a family, but kind of, you know, so you, you don't feel just uh, it's AC Milan. And there's us. No, it's one club and I think that's something that's important also for for us to see what's what's our standing. Do they take it serious with the women's football? Um, but uh, I have to say they really do. Like they really want the women to be successful and to, yeah, to step by step getting a better team and making women's football more attractive. And also you can also write some history with the women's side. Obviously AC Milan is a huge club. They won a lot in the in the past in the history, and why not doing the same with the women? Mm-hmm. And uh, Julia, you know what are some of the challenges you face playing in the women's game these days? Mm, I think it's still kind of a <laughs> daily fight. You you fight a bit. So when you see men's football, it's basically accepted everywhere. Like every little boy would dream to become Messi one day or Ronaldo mm. or. Neymar and football is everywhere. Whereas for young girls, it's a bit different, I would say. Even like, obviously for me, that's already 20 years ago when I was in, in an age where it became a bit serious for me. But it's, it's a bit different from the way people see the game, you know, whereas young, young boys who are playing, they get support from everywhere, from their coaches, from their parents, from their friends, from their teachers, from whoever. Whereas young girls, they sometimes have to yeah, justify themselves. Why are you playing football? I always get asked, why did you start playing football? You won't ask, ask as a professional footballer in the men's side. Yeah. You, because it's just normal for boys to play football. And mm-hmm. for, for girls, it, I would say it's still not really normal. And that's something, obviously, that changed during the time since I'm in the game, what I could experience so far. But I think there's still a lot of work to do also in a grassroots level better infrastructure. I had, to, I had to play with boys until I was 16 because there were not really competitive women or um, girls teams around my, my area. So for me, it was good and I loved it to play with the boys and it was like paid off at the end of the day. But at the same time, I wish for young girls to be able to choose like, do I want to play with the boys or do I want to play with the girls? Just because Maybe some don't like it with the boys, so but they still have a chance to play football then. And that's something slowly, I think, to start um, be accepted more and more also in, in, in the heads of parents and just in the society. And I think the more visible women's football is, the more normal it becomes. So when you see football everywhere, it should also be shown women's football, not everywhere, but a bit more now you have the internet and the social media and all that kind of platforms which helps for young girls also to yeah lift their dream I would say. Mm, and, and do you think this is something that maybe you can change uh, on a personal level for yourself for example can you like approach schools in Germany or something you know like yeah, to, yeah, definitely. To, yeah. definitely I think at one side Obviously, you have to. I have this kind of. I feel like I have the responsibility a, a bit in me because I was lucky enough to made it to this level and lucky enough to have support around me. But I know that a lot of young girls are struggling to find support, to have people around them they, that inspire them, they keep them motivated, they help them, they they are for them when they have questions or any kind of support, right? And like I started to. Um, run a football academy, a football school for, for girls in, in Germany. I did some camps over mm-hmm. there in England as well. And I think that's also something I want to give something a little bit back and I want to put girls in the spotlight. So when a young girl signs up for a camp, normally there are 50 boys and two or three girls. And I want it the other way around. So I had some camps last summer and there were like 20 girls and three of our boys. 
And uh, mm -hmm. that was something, when I see this, I get almost goosebumps because I think it's not like, it's not the end of the, of the fight, I know this, but it shows a little bit that it could be this way as well. And that also boys would come to a basically girls camp and would still be comfortable. And it should be normal. And I think it should be normal if it's 10 girls playing and 10 boys playing and they all can play together to a certain age without having any kind of fear or, you know, the, so that's something I'm, I'm really passionate about and want to give girls more access basically to, to play football as well. And, well, and yeah, Bala? Oh, do you face, uh, like whenever any, any club you play, so when you walk around the streets or in the shops, People are coming asking you autograph or the kind of experience you had before? Um, yeah, sometimes that happens, um, especially when I'm home in my home area in Nuremberg or in yeah, Bavaria, where I'm from, in Munich as well, because people would maybe follow you on Instagram or Facebook or things like this, and then they recognize you, and it can happen, obviously, that they also ask for an autograph or a selfie, but that's something where... I would call it lucky where we are not in this huge spotlight to not be able to go out anymore. Uh, but it's still nice to obviously get recognized and that people ask you for a selfie. It's always a, a, a special moment, I would say. And, and since we were earlier speaking about challenges as well, you know, uh, recently Saudi Arabia just started their own women's football league this year. You know, it's a major step in wow. the right direction for women's football in general. So Julia, you know, what are your thoughts about this and how far do you think a women's football come? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really had this in my head anymore, but I heard about this. But that's, mm -hmm. that's something that, where you can see it goes into the right direction for me because it's not only about, I don't know, making money with football or playing at the highest level at one point. It's also a bit of a movement in the society, I would say. So that women, for example, can go to football stadiums also that women can also be part of this game that women can work in football that women can play football all these little things they it, it should be like this it should empower women so when i speak to the young girls and i also ask them all, always why do you start playing football and most of them would just say because it's fun but others also think of more and they feel like ah because i have so many friends here because i can socialize here i can communicate i can also compete, you know, that's also something you have challenges in the game itself, which is important. You have success, you have failure, but you still, you compete and you try again and you get tackled and you fall down and you stand up again. And that's something I think to take, it can be other sports as well. It's just important to do sports for, in my opinion, and football, I think can teach a lot. So taking all these attributes that football give you and maybe take them with you on another environment or another level or, another area also is, is, is really it's a good thing to have and it's really helpful so playing football is not only for the sake of making it to a professional player it can be so much more and I think having this step also from Saudi Arabia now is is huge I think for them it's a huge huge step whereas for us we already complain on a high level to maybe not be shown enough in TV as, a, as an example mm -hmm. or not get equal pay Things like this, whereas there it's already a huge step that girls are allowed to play now, that they have a, maybe clubs they can participate in. And yes. that's already a, a huge step for me. And it's brilliant that this is going to happen now. Mm, okay. Talking about your, maybe not now, but in the future when you retire, uh, <laughs> did you consider managing a football team or you have anything else in the plan? Um, yes, like everything is possible. I, I know that I'm going to stay in football. That's my, my dream and I think my passion as well. So keep doing football is basically what I, I want to do for the rest of my life. So I studied sports science okay. um, and I, could, I, I started running my own football academy. Um, I just squeezed this in basically always when I had a little bit of time or not basically when season, so that's always a short period in the year only, but that's something I want to put more effort and more time into when I retire, basically. And my retirement, I'm already 31 years old, so it's not going to last for too long that I keep playing. But as soon as I retire, I, I will still be in football. And yeah, either this is as a coach or with the football academy or 
running a football team could be something as well, like managing it. Um, there are so many options, luckily. Like I, I know I'm living in a really privileged time and privileged um, area as well to be able to think about things like this. So it, it's, it's exciting. And I, all I know is at the moment that I keep, I want to keep staying in football, yeah. I think there's a guy in uh, Milan team who Karina is still playing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> do, do you bump into him every now and then? Uh, by the way, the guy that we're talking about is Latan Ibrahimovic. Latan, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you, do you bump into him every now and then? Yeah, no, because not, not regularly. Like, I, I've bumped into him once because I was at the men's training ground for a, yeah, for a muscle test and then... Mm. He was there as well, and then you see him, and you think like, looks so normal, you know. Okay. <laughs> like they always, I think they look more impressive when you see them in the TV, to be honest. So when you see them live, it's more like, ciao, come esta, and that's it. that's like, hey, how are you? Mm-hmm. And that's it, you know. And um, then you think, okay, it's it, you. You think of Slatan like, wow, what an idol and a big name in football, right? And he looks a bit. Sometimes he's a bit. Yeah, I can create fear maybe around him a little bit, but then he's like just a nice guy who also says hello, how are you, and ciao, for example. And that's really nice to see. So the thing is, we train somewhere else where the men's training ground is, so they really separate a bit out of Milan, and we train in another area. So this is why we don't see them every day or every week, but when I see them, they always nice and and friendly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and of course, in your career, you have played for some of the more established clubs like Bayern Munich, West Ham, and of course, currently now AC Milan. Is there any difference in terms of the operation between the men's and the women's football section? I would say yes. There's still a difference. So when you, especially with these big clubs you just mentioned, um, there's a whole section basically behind the men's club running the men's side, right? So. Mm-hmm. We normally have a lot less people working for the women's side because there's also less stuff to manage. When you think of Bayern Munich, when you think of the men's side and the, all the teams, also the youth teams and how many people really work there. So I would say from the approach, from the way it works, it's completely the, the same, apart maybe from the, yeah, from the media side, side of it. So it's not like we're not like the huge stars like they are. We don't have as many spectators maybe in the stadium as they have but everything else from the daily business from the way we train from maybe the amount of time is even more when like where women's train um what i experienced so far um but everything else yeah as i say is completely the same uh, i would say it's just the dimension of the surrounding and of the attraction is a little bit different but also when you speak to to male footballers i would say they always like to have it normal so and that's just something sometimes in the media they I think you experience them a little bit different than they really are and that's that's something nice I would say uh, with knowing this a little bit mm-hmm. okay interesting guys uh, any other question yeah uh, Julia you know, I just wanted to ask you you know what are your aspirations for the next uh, the coming the next World Cup in 2023 in Australia and New Zealand would it be one final hurrah for you um, so yeah, I, I just, I just hope it's, it's, I was at the last world cup in, in France as a, not, not as an athlete. I was there with the FIFA a little bit and was just traveling around seeing, watching some games and yeah, having some experiences behind closed doors, I would say. And that was great to see how far the women's game came already. So there were some. Yeah, there was like a FIFA legend tournament where I participated with all big names like Figo and all of them were there. And that's something where I think, okay, that's crazy that the women's game attract players and legends like this, you know. And mm-hmm. I just hope this can continue like this. So let's say if the World Cups hopefully is going to be played 2023, um, that it's still as huge as it was in France with all the media, with all the people come in there and want to see it. Obviously, it's not going to be in Europe. I would say Europe is maybe the football center a little bit sometimes with Champions League and the European leagues who attract a lot of like the best players maybe in the world, but still also bringing football over there and 
attracting also over there young girls to play football. Obviously, I, I won't be a part of this as an athlete, <laughs> unfortunately, but I just hope for the women's game. Well, who knows? Who knows? You have a great season <laughs> in Milan and, you know, you keep <laughs> assisting like, your, you know, like what Zidane was doing. <laughs> If you say this, exactly, like, look, look at Slatan, right? He's yeah, 39. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, it's only, I'm only 20, uh, 34 when this is going to happen. So, everything is possible. <laughs> but, yeah, if we're really honest or really realistic, probably not. But still, I just hope it's going to be huge. It's going to be in front of spectators and the stadiums are full. And it's going to be a huge event, hopefully, again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. For me, Julia, basically... Who you think, like in men's football, we have a lot of idols, uh, heroes, you know, even even with the late Diego Madonna and previously was uh, currently, sorry, uh, with the Messi and Ronaldo. In terms of women football, in your opinion, who you think is some kind of a highly figure who may change the landscape of footballing for women's football in the future? Mm, so I would say every country has a, has a little bit their own idols now and their role models and the people who maybe also raise or women who raise their voices for the sport so if you see for example megan rapino mm -hmm. um and an american girl who won the world cup lately as well with her team she she for example created a big movement like she was like the loudspeaker of the american national team or the usa team and that's something i think a lot of girls in other nations looked a bit up to her and seeing what's possible if you actually like fight for your, I wouldn't call it fight for your rights, but fight a bit for your game, you know. She would be going in front of court to basically ask for equal payment and that girls should be treated the same in terms of the equal payment is something that, that can't be used always in the right context, I would say. It's, it's not about we want to earn the same amount of money like the men. That's something we are all realistic enough to see, okay, the men's game is a lot bigger. I think the thing we're asking for is for a good infrastructure for saying, okay, when you train, you have a physio there. So you can get a tape, for example, before training, or you can be assessed if something happens during training. You have access to a doctor, for example, with injuries. You have access to a good rehab if you're injured. You have so many, you have access to a good pitch where you don't feel like, ah, oh, I'm going to hurt myself or injure myself if I train here longer for than one one week or something so little things like this or you c come in a dressing room where where the heaters work and the showers are warm and little things like this that's something that's not everywhere normal and this should change and that's obviously something i think every nation now has their captains like we for example we have in germany alexandra pop and jenny marushan the captain of the national teams and you have a lot of great, great, great people and characters over there in England. Like the England national team is also a great, great country now. And I think you, you need these characters more to also change something. So when you think of football, now in Saudi Arabia, they started a league. Wow, brilliant. Maybe you wouldn't have thought this five years ago, right? And that's just happening because the pressure from the society and from the people in the game um, it increases and that's step by step getting the ball rolling a little bit everywhere I would say in every direction and that's that's really important for the game to grow mm -hmm. I mean it's interesting that you elaborate a little bit more on the equal pay part because I think it's there's a lot of misunderstanding among the the general football public that thinking that that women actually they're demanding for the same kind of uh, you know um, pay pay in terms of the salary as the, what's the men's game. But I think you elaborated better for, for everyone to understand that this is not about earning. This is more about facilities. Yeah. This is more about the platform, ensuring that, you know, women's uh, access to, you know, better playing conditions and all that. I think that's, that part is, yeah, I mean, we really appreciate that part that you mentioned to us. Yeah. And it's important for people to understand they might then read the newspaper and think, oh, now they're asking for equal pay, but they play in front of 5,000 people, whereas the men's, they fill a stadium week in and week out and you know that's different and they have 100 channels who would stream the game and obviously obviously it's a different different kind of sport in this context but at the same time all we ask for is a lot of girls for example they compete on the highest league in Germany and before in England and in Italy and they have to keep working for example I have a normal job next to their football site right and that's something where I think that's just something that 
could be the case in a in a certain way, but shouldn't be anymore because I think the the leagues they should be as professional that they can at least give the girls let's say enough salary that they can come there that they also can have access what I said before to have a healthy kind of life to reduce the risk of getting injured as well by putting more time into your body, putting more time into your yeah, care about your body treatment, all these little things where you wouldn't have ta enough time and I experienced this when you have a 40 hour job per week, you know, like when you go to work every day for eight hours and you go to train in the afternoon at six or seven and there's not even a physio there. That's obviously something that need, needed a change and I think it's changing slowly, but it's not that we want to earn millions and play in front of a, an empty stadium. That's something to understand. There's, there's a difference. And we know this, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right. So guys, uh, any more last questions? No, I just, uh, I'm, I'm okay. I just want to thank Julia for joining us on this show today. Thank you so much, Julia. Really welcome. Thanks for having me. Bala? Yeah, me too, Julia. Thank you so much for attending us. Uh, good luck in your Milan uh, journey and uh, hopefully you do the best and hopefully you can meet us again. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, same, same as well. I mean, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, good luck on the season. And, you know, hopefully... Who we'll knows see you today? in the World Cup. Yeah. Look <laughs> <laughs> yeah. out for me. And, and wearing the German number 10, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that's important, right? That's important. <laughs> yeah, that's important. You will have at least a three nation fan here supporting you, Rory. Yeah. 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 And, I, I mean, when that woman comes, perhaps you might look back and, you know, remember the Bola Bola show. This, that is where it all <laughs> happened. This brought me to the national team, back to the national team. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so right. much. Okay. Any last word from yourself, Julia? Um, no, I'm really happy to be a guest here and that you also use your platform to speak about women's football. I think it's always great for us just having platforms, making people aware of our sport, I would say. And yeah, hopefully um, it made a little bit of sense what I was saying. <laughs> and I hope you have another, <laughs> a lot of other women's or players or athletes or participants in, in women's football on, on your show. <laughs> okay. In fact, you know, to be... Uh... You are the first professional footballer currently okay. right now, both men and women, as the, the first in our show, to be honest. Big honor yeah. for me. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, with that said, everyone, we will end this week's episode of the Bola Bola Show. And thank you for listening. Uh -huh.